information about the content of the image being viewed in the first place. So uh, next slide, please. So this one, this example uh, is another one. Um, it's a little harder to figure out how alternative text fits in here. Um, the viewer still provides a title, but that title isn't explaining that it's a transcript file or that multiple pages are involved. So there are other parts within the viewer that might give that con that might give that context, but it's not really an alternative text sort of uh, uh, sort of offering of information. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, the IIIF cookbook uh, does show that there are ways to provide uh, transcript access uh, alongside various formats like newspapers or audio and video, um, but does that serve the role uh, of alternative text for accessibility purposes in this case? And it's possible, but um, in the IIIF cookbook, it's not, it's not really talked about in those terms. Uh, next slide, please. So, and then back to Hyrax, looking at the file set list for this, uh, this multi-page multi document, um, how does alternative text for images work with the file set list for this? So again, this example has file names for titles on this, um, on the file set, but should alternative text be provided here in some other way instead? Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so digital collections are, are showing digital objects. So within Hyrax, uh, we're seeing some places that alternative text might be possible or available on images, but how is that supplied? And how do we recommend that happening? Uh, does that fulfill accessibility requirements? And does it actually increase accessibility for the digital collections that are accessed via Hyrax? Uh, additionally, um, the IIIF viewer accessibility is something to consider. So how is alternative text for images supplied? If there's OCR or transcripts available uh, for images with text, does that work for accessibility purposes? Um, there's been discussion in the IIIF community about how to model transcript information so it can be made available in HTML or where description of the image should be expected, considering an alternative text style description of uh, what the image shows or the transcription of text in the image or even both, uh, and if that should be part of the manifest. Um, if there are options via IIIF now, providing that information along with our Hyrax documentation would assist organizations evaluating Hyrax or Haiku when considering accessibility. Um, so how much of this is an issue that the larger arena of digital collection software and institutional repository software is managing? Uh, reviewing other paths taken might also help us uh, provide guidance or make changes to what we're doing for enhancing access to digital collections served through Samvera products. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, coming out of conversations in the metadata interest group. Um, and it might also be coming up in the roadmaps alignment group a little bit within Samvera. So a, a UX study uh, could help identify gaps in accessibility around alternative texts or accessible viewing of digital objects. Uh, if there are recommendations or documentation that the Samvera community can provide or work that we can do with other communities like IIIF, um, that also seems uh, like a good avenue to explore. Um, if there are changes we need to make to Hyrax or other software products that we uh, offer through the Samvera community, writing those up as issues in GitHub uh, can help us prioritize and move that work forward. So next slide is just kind of, this is our contact information uh, if you're interested in talking more about this or uh, moving some of this along. Thank you. Thank you both, that was excellent. I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation. Okay, I'm gonna hand things over to uh, Michael and David. Hello, um, my name is Michael Klein, and I am here with my colleague, David Schober from Northwestern University Libraries. Hello, I'm David Schober. In uh, 2018, David and I delivered a talk on what was then our past two years of experiences, uh, reimagining, remaking, and refining our application development and deployment ecosystem. A lot has happened in the four years uh, since our last presentation, new projects, new services, new deployment tools, and new architecture. So today we're here to provide some uh, updates. The last time we were here, we had just started using Terraform for infrastructure management. Uh, Terraform being a, a tool that lets you write infrastructure as code um, and that lets you manage your infrastructure um, and keep it in a consistent state. We had started getting a feel for AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, and started using AWS native services for things like Elasticsearch and their relational database service instead of running our own servers. Uh, 
for that part, it was a joy not to have to worry about scaling for those services and, and maintenance and certain other issues. Elastic Beanstalk was working out okay. We still had um, a couple apps and still have a couple apps that rely on Solar Cloud. Um, and stability was a bit of a problem with Solar Cloud. Uh, but just as we started thinking about, uh, you know, kicking back and celebrating with a couple mojitos, a global pandemic hit and we had to cancel the party. So we decided to just sit around and rethink our stack again. Several of the issues on this slide mirror the ones uh, on the same slide four years ago. Um, the ones that motivated our move from AWS cloud formation to Terraform in the first place. Uh, our Terraform code, which was maintained in a single monolithic repository, became brittle and unwieldy and uh, just too big to manage. Small changes to one set of resources threatened to break other sometimes unrelated resources. Much like last time, um, we started to make changes directly in the AWS console or from the command line because it was just easier and more expedient and um, then figuring out how to automate them. Uh, Terraform has come a long way in the past four years, and so have we. Um, lots of things are different, but this last bullet point is completely unchanged for the 2018 version of this talk. Every manual, manual change we made racked up technical debt because it had to be documented and repeated. So we were doing better, but it was still complicated. Elastic Beanstalk, the AWS managed uh, server platform, still wasn't quite working for us. It couldn't um, handle solar cloud outages and replace nodes uh, without breaking things. Its web and worker tiers were rather difficult to manage. Its multi-container Docker platform that we were using didn't always start up reliably, so we would have to intervene manually a whole lot. And there was just basically too much magic between us and our code. Uh, it made support complicated. Nothing was straightforward. Um, we had to do things the Elastic Beanstalk way or no way at all. Um, and small changes weren't always quick to deploy, uh, just like changing a single environment variable on a running server might trigger a time-consuming redeployment of entire EC2 virtual machine instances, uh, which uh, was just not particularly easy for us. At the same time, we also started developing a new greenfield staff-facing digital collections management application we call Meadow. Um, we were working on a brand new application stack uh, with uh, Elixir, a new programming language, Phoenix, a new web framework, GraphQL um, API with IIIF and Elasticsearch Index behind it. Um, it's designed, uh, in addition to its uh, interactive operations, it's designed for bulk operations, for ingest, editing, and management. Um, those who have seen David's pr uh, presentation on our preservation first approach uh, can understand. Uh, for those who haven't, I, I recommend looking it up because it really speaks to the, the philosophy that we're working under. Both the collections and the assets uh, in them greatly increased in size. We were dealing with more items and the items we were dealing with were much larger in size. Um, so that came with new requirements for load balancing and networking including the ability to pass WebSockets through our load balancer for um, certain, for GraphQL subscriptions um, and, and some pub sub type architecture. And we also started offloading more types of work to native AWS services or um, things that we wrote custom, but in the form of serverless Lambda functions like our ingest pipeline is almost entirely made up of coordinated Lambda functions um, that allow us to scale our most resource intensive, resource intensive operations horizontally without having to provision those resources inside the scope of our app container. So our core application can run lean and we can just provision more resources on the fly as we need them, pay as for what we use and let them go away when we don't need them. 
Um, we're also using AWS Elemental Media Convert for our media transcoding. We also uh, did a lot of refactoring of our infrastructure. I mentioned that big Terraform repository uh, we were running that became impossible to manage. So now instead of one massive Terraform project, we now have about 10 smaller ones, which may not sound better, but it is. Um, each project inside is responsible for one service, one set of related services, or one application. Uh, the Terraform code for core services uh, lives inside a shared infrastructure repo. Um, but the Terraform code for each application lives in the application repo. So for our Avalon instance, the Terraform lives inside our Avalon repo. And for Meadow, it's inside the Meadow repo. This lets us uh, maintain the infrastructure while we're maintaining the code, keeps a consistent uh, sort of Git history. You can see what resources change while the code is changing. Um, it allows you to deploy a tagged version um, alongside its infrastructure that just the, the benefits are uh, innumerable. And deploying in smaller chunks led to more manageable change sets so that we could um, verify visually the changes that were about to take place um, without um, having to read through screens and screens of changes. Um, easier reversions to previous state if something went wrong and much cleaner documentation for each piece. Um, it does mean we have to keep our downstream dependencies well documented so that if we change something, say in our data services infrastructure, we make sure to also redeploy the apps that depend on the data services infrastructure so they get their new settings. But um, we've been pretty good about that. Um, and it makes it pretty easy to keep the entire stack in sync. We also got off of Elastic Beanstalk's multi-docker, multi-container Docker platform and went straight to Amazon's Elastic Container Service, where we can run containers directly on infrastructure managed entirely invisibly to us by AWS. Um, everything that used to be a server is now a scalable number of tasks grouped as services within AWS Elastic Container Service. Uh, spin ups and shutdowns are pretty quick. Um, the, the technology behind it is called AWS Fargate Compute Serverless Compute Engine. Um, and it just lets us run our containers without having to manage the servers they run on. No more EC2 instances to manage, just containers in the cloud. Uh, we're still considering whether we have a, a use for Kubernetes uh, via uh, AWS offers a, an elastic Kubernetes service as well. But so far, ECS is doing everything we need uh, really well. So we haven't found a compelling case to switch over. As for things that aren't containers, uh, we still use AWS, managed AWS services when possible. We use their relational database service for Postgres SQL, their Elasticache service for our Redis uh, cache, we use Elasticsearch, which we're not, we've now moved to Amazon's OpenSearch, which is a fork of Elasticsearch. Um, their queue and notification servers to coordinate uh, some of our asynchronous operations and the aforementioned media convert for transcoding media. Um, other services like our IIIF server, uh, anyone who's seen my serverless IIIF presentation knows that we've invested pretty heavily in serverless um, APIs to run IIIF. We also have an index data API that sits in front of Elasticsearch. And those are coded in Node.js that run as serverless functions invoked by REST APIs managed by AWS API Gateway. We also created a scalable checksum generator using AWS STUP functions. Um, most of our TIFF images are in the five to 20 megabyte range, but every so often we have a batch of three and a half gigabyte TIFFs, or uh, now that we've added support for audiovisual resources, some of our assets might even be multiple terabytes in size. Before step functions, we had to choose between letting those large items fail or be reprocessed manually or offline, or even 
not be able to be processed in the cloud at all uh, because of resource limits versus tuning our functions for the largest known case, which wastes resources on all of the smaller ones. You know, if you provision your Lambda for the three and a half gigabyte TIFF, you know, a thousand five megabyte TIFFs running through are going to waste a lot of CPU and RAM uh, that they didn't need. Um, we also shifted checksum generation so that it happens at upload time. The, the step function is triggered by uh, the upload um, and just adds some tags to the, the object in our um, storage, S3 storage. And that works well with our preservation first strategy by seeding the initial fixity data even before a file is officially ingested into our repository. It also speeds up the synchronous part of the ingest process by performing one of the more potentially time and resource of intensive resource intensive fu functions in the background. Um, and it also allows uh, gives us some visibility into the, the process in real time. So given the success of that, we we are looking into um, on our roadmap replacing our entire existing ingest pipeline dispatcher with step functions. Um, which would basically coordinate our existing serverless um, ingest pipeline functions uh, better than we're currently doing it in our custom Elixir code. Quick digression into step functions. Um, a step function is um, a declaratively defined state machine there's this visual editor for development that looks a lot like this image here. You can drag and drop and, and point things to new states and set conditions and, and design it based on your flowchart. Um, it can also export to a YAML syntax for repeatable deployment. It can coordinate complex functions. It can invoke or evaluate nearly any AWS service API that you give it access to. Um, it gives you easy visual, visualization of both success and failure paths. This is a, this diagram shows a successful checksum generation. Uh, there's detailed logging for each step of each run and the timeout can be set as high as one year. So if you have long running operations or even functions that have to wait for external conditions to be met, like somebody to sign off on something, step functions can handle all of it. As for cost, um, we, from January through March of this year, we migrated thousands of hours of video um, from our audio visual repository into Meadow, and we ingested a whole lot of images as well, overall adding 43,000 file sets into 8,100 works. We generated checksums for all of them on the fly, and the total cost for those three, three months was about $9. We've also revamped our development environment somewhat. Um, you know, here we are pretending that any of us still actually sit next to each other. Uh, this is so new, it's not even rolled out to the whole team yet. The only person using it has been me, but um, each developer is gonna have a dedicated EC2 instance. We will have a shared scalable Postgres instance running with separate databases for each developer. Uh, costly resources like those ET2 instances and the database engines scale up on demand and scale down when idle. Each environment will have its own full set of resources to allow for independent work, but also easy collaboration. It's, uh, it has seamless integration with Visual Studio Code via the official remote SSH extension. So working in the cloud uh, feels almost exactly like working on my uh, laptop. And it also offers quick and easy seeding of production data into the development environments by just copying over relevant uh, data and database records uh, from, the, from our production environment, which we have read access to from the development environment. So we've made some discoveries. Um, in 2018, we pointed out that containers aren't virtual machines. And we pointed out that that's both a benefit and a bit of an inconvenience. Um, when we moved our containers off of EC2 instances, we gave up the ability to get um, a, a shell, um, an interactive shell on or near the container. But it turns out that AWS offers a service called Systems Manager, 
that provides an easier, more secure way to drop into a shell or run another command inside the container. And we can also send shell commands or scripting commands directly to multiple running containers at once, either by their IDs or by a set of tags, just you know, everything, send this command to all systems that match this uh, set of metadata. Um, really quickly, uh, David loves dashboards. Um, so we iterate on them just like code. Um, when we have an incident that could have benefited from some logging or metrics we didn't have easy access to, we add it to the dashboard or even better, create an alarm to watch for the condition that will notify us when it happens. It gives us insight into running tasks, the health of the overall system and each resource within it, near real-time cost information, uh, logging, um, information where we've determined, we've discovered that choosing what not to log is sometimes even more important than choosing what to log. Um, if you can see this particular one down at the bottom, um, our combined Elastic Container Service task log is full of Rails deprecation warnings and little else. Um, so it makes it hard to find the, what we're actually looking for. And on the right side, it gives us some documentation at a glance, just some static uh, links and info that are useful um, in situations where we need to move fast. Um, in conclusion, uh, we've discovered that cloud native development allows us to be agile in just about everything. Developing in the cloud makes it remarkably easy to prototype, stand things up, tear things down, try things out. Um, we're fortunate to have a university environment and I, central IT that is committed to the cloud and, and the resources to make the most of it. Um, costs, uh, cost management is for managers, but cloud pricing can be very tricky and it can sometimes be good for developers and staff users to be able to see exactly which things cost money uh, so that we can uh, figure out where to expend the effort to tune, it, tune things. And um, Filtering is important. Don't spam your developers or, or their Slack channels. Be selective about what you choose to alert on. Uh, Real-time development is tricky. Um, you need live data. Doing end-to-end -end testing requires having a full environment stood up and mocking and emulation can only go so far when you're trying to do a real-world test. So it's been great for us. And uh, here we go, use our stuff. Uh, we have a bunch of public repositories, a bunch of Docker images, um, we try to document well. Um, most of what we have is pretty specific to our needs and, and tied to our environment, but uh, hopefully is pretty adaptable. And here's some contact information if you want to get in touch with either me or David or anyone else on the team with questions or comments or anything else. <laughs>